Yeah, change. I mean, change is, a, is a, um, a, an absolutely fascinating um, area to look at. We all have different kinds of attitudes towards change. You know, some of us love... We were talking about it uh, over here, weren't we, about change and kind of like not liking it. And all. Some people hate change. They don't want anything to change. Some people love change and run headlong into it. Other people want what change has to offer, but they're kind of scared of the journey in between. And it's really interesting. Your attitude towards change completely determines the outcome of change. Think about that again for a second. Your attitude toward change affects the outcome of change. If you embrace it, you can take advantage of it. You know the entrepreneurs, that oh, they say, uh, you know, an entrepreneur goes by the acronym Ready, Fire, Aim. Get it out there, get going. They embrace change, they live on it, they thrive on it. Others, ready, aim, aim, aim. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's, and it's fascinating. An 18th century physicist called George Lichtenberg once said, I cannot say whether things will get better if we change, but I can say that they must change if they are to get better. Now, you don't need me to tell you that the world is changing at an enormous pace. Indeed, if you look back through time, you come to realise that it's not so much about the speed of change as it is about its acceleration. Now, I want to explore this by introducing you to a lady called Neva Morris. Neva was born in 1895 and lived to the ripe old age of 116. She only died just recently. But in her one lifetime, Neva has witnessed a staggering amount of change. When she was born, the first telephone was invented, but not yet commercialised. In France, the Lumiere brothers made the first motion picture the year she was born, but there weren't any cinemas to show it in. Radio would come along in her teens, black and white television by the time she was middle-aged, and she'd be of retirement age by the time the transistor radio came along, if any of us can remember what one of those is. But today, the average 11-year-old holds in their hand a single device on which they can play games, listen to music, watch movies, and call or text virtually anybody in the world. In her life, she's seen the first car, the first man-powered flight, the first transatlantic and round-the-world voyage, the first man on the moon, the first mission to Mars, the first space station floating permanently in orbit, accessible to anyone who's fit enough or can afford the fare, like Guy Lilibeté from Cirque du Soleil. From horse and cart to space tourism in one lifetime. That is a staggering amount of change. And it's change that's speeding up, not slowing down. Look at what's happened since Neva turned 100. In 1995, the internet was just becoming popularly known. It's estimated that there were about 10,000 websites. Today, there are over a billion. Connecting a third of the world's population, that's two billion people in real time. It took television 38 years to reach 50 million uh, um, listeners. It took television, sorry, 13 years to reach 50 million viewers. It took Facebook one year to do the same. YouTube. YouTube is the biggest television network on the planet. It serves up one billion videos a day to 200 million people. And this device here, depending on what age you are, it's not a mobile phone, it's a texting device. 10 times more texts are sent by people under 20 than phone calls made. The internet is changing the way we live, work, play, and dream, and it's connecting people of different races and cultures and nations in ways that only a science fiction writer could have imagined when Neva was born. Okay, so what? Well, here's what I find interesting. Despite all the man-made change as witnessed by the life of Neva Morris, despite the fact that the universe is built around change and growth and renewal. And despite the fact that every single cell in our body changes every seven years, so despite all of this, some of us still have a hard time with change. We resist it. Now to me, that's like this. 
That's like trying to resist the wind, it's futile. Now I get it, change is frightening. Change means letting go of something that you're comfortable with. It means making difficult choices. It means getting outside of your comfort zone. So what do we do? We wait. We wait for the doctor to scare us before we stop doing something we know is going to kill us. We wait for the bank to foreclose before we stop spending money that we're not earning. And we wait for our relationships to fall apart before we stop and realise it's been a long time since we just simply said, I love you. And it's the same in business, you know the story. GE didn't have the courage to make the difficult choices when their market changed. And so, they paid the price. Atari. Atari invented computer gaming. Then they stood by and watched the whole industry take off without them. Polaroid, they invented instant photography and then were crushed by digital cameras. The list goes on and on. Wang Labs, Woolworths, Nortel Networks. From leader, to loser, because they failed to adapt. Now, contrast this with organizations that did change, organizations that saw the possibilities that change represented. When Lou Gershner took over IBM, they were losing eight billion a year. He ripped it apart. The company that invented mainframes and computing got out of the hardware business. It was gut-wrenching, but it was also the greatest turnaround in corporate history. GE, they recognised that they were in too many businesses, so Jack Welsh made a simple choice. Either we're one or two in our chosen market, or we get out. Again, it was gut-wrenching. They had to lay off some perfectly good businesses. But again, it was a choice of genius. In 2002, McDonald's were hemorrhaging money as their customers went off in search of healthier food options. So they completely redesigned their menu, much to the fear of their franchisees. They brought in salads and low-fat food options. The franchisees said, well, all you're doing is cannibalizing the core burger market. But it turned out to be a choice of genius. So what can we learn? Well, I think it is this. Change, change is a choice. You can choose to resist, or you can choose to change. You can choose to see change as something that happens to you, or as something that you make happen. Because one thing is clear. Through all of the man-made change, as witnessed by a lifetime of Neva Morris, not one of it, not one bit of that change happened as a result of people who said, you know what, we've always done it like this, let's just leave as it is. It all happened because of people who were unafraid of change, who were unafraid to innovate, who grasped the possibilities that were there for everybody, but they grasped and they did something about it. Because the world is about change, and life is about adapting and evolving. As Aldous Huxley said, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do about what happens. Because what we do, the choices we make, you were talking about choices, those are the things that define us as human beings and as leaders. So ahead of you, you have a spectrum of choices now available to you about how you are going to embrace the new possibilities that you're being shared with today. And you can think of the Dabawala, you can think of Cirque du Soleil, you can think of what are those dirt floors and you can think, what choices do I now have available to me that I maybe didn't have only an hour or so ago?